Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World. Later in the programme, has Georgia been betrayed by NATO? I'll be hearing from that country's Deputy Prime Minister, plus the Foreign Minister of Mozambique and the newspaper Magnet, his business growing all the time, Evgeny Lebedev. Uh, but we begin with the crisis in the Eurozone, where Ireland has followed Greece to become the second country to be bailed out by its European neighbours. The bond market remains jittery, has done all this week, as attention now turns to Portugal, Spain and even Belgium. Could they be next in line? And what must Europe's leaders do now? Joining me from Paris is a very busy lady at the moment and a very accomplished one, France's Finance Minister, Christine Lagarde. Madame, Christine, um, in the situation today, um, one of the headlines here in the papers in London today is, of course, again about Portugal and so on. How fearful are you about Portugal? So, David, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not fearful. I don't think that fear is a good advisor. <laughs> uh, what, I, uh, what I look at very carefully at the moment is numbers, rates, spreads, and obviously uh, the long-term uh, jobs or projects that we have been working on uh, with the Europeans, including the UK, and for certain matters uh, within the Eurozone. And it seems to me that what we have done in relation to, number one, a better and stronger governance of the European Union and of the Eurozone in particular. We have not completed the job, but we've really significantly uh, moved the project ahead. And what we've done concerning the permanent crisis resolution mechanism, which again needs more explanation, clarification and all the rest of it, are two important directions to really clarify our joint uh, approach and our joint determination to, number one, restore the quality of our public finances, and number two, support our joint currency, the euro. And uh, at this time, would you, would you be confident enough to, to say that there will be no more bailouts, or can one not predict that at the moment? Well, you, you never say, fountain, I will not drink your water. That's a, that's a <laughs> little proverb, that, motto that we have here in France. Uh. Fontaine, je ne boirai pas de ton eau, never say. Uh, but, but frankly, I really think that we are addressing the substantive issues. When each and every member of the Eurozone says, I have to reduce my deficit. I have to embark on a sustainable debt program and I have to do that in the short term in the medium term and in the long term and when you see governments uh, brave enough to actually confront public opinions brave enough to resist public pressure and I can tell you under the leadership of President Sarkozy we've just been through that uh, resisting the anti-pension reform movement that brought people to the streets and to which we resisted. So I think that from a substantive point of view, uh, we are in the right direction. We need to stay the course and we need to be determined doing so to avoid uh, a relapse um, and, and a recurrence of what we have observed in the last uh, 12 months or so. But you clearly, you wouldn't want to say outright, Christine, that there will be no more bailouts. That would be going too certitude, too much certitude. As I said, uh, Sir David, we, we need to focus on the substantive issues. We cannot be like rabbits in the headlights of a car. Uh, we need to stay focused on those two major initiatives. We need to communicate well that we are not just a collection of separate member states. We are also bound by the same collective drive to support our currency and to restore the, fin the public finance of each and every member state. Now, when you look at us as, as a collective group, as many more you know, financial yeah. um, interests have done in the past few months, uh, when you look at us collectively, our level of deficit, our level of debt, 
our overall economic situation from a macroeconomic point of view is actually quite a good story to tell. And, you know, what we need to do is to translate that collective approach into a collective way of governing ourselves properly down at each and every member state level. And that's the path that we have embarked on. And this week, uh, Journal du Dimanche had that headline, Financial Crisis, France Threatened. Um, you don't look as though you're feeling threatened. You're quite right. <laughs> you read my mind and my, my, my face properly. I do not feel threatened. I feel very encouraged. I feel determined. But I do not feel threatened. And the latest statement by Standard & Poor's, uh, who said that uh, France deserves its AAA ranking, was certainly an element of reassurance, if I needed one. Right. And so that was, yes, reassurance if you needed it. And what's the, uh, and what's the situation of uh, all the member states? Are they all in line together with you? Uh, do you feel that unity that you mentioned earlier is really there among all the, all the member states? Or are there member states who are privately saying that, well, we're, just, we're running out of patience with all these bailouts. There's going to come a moment when we're not going to bail someone out because this is going too far. Do any of them say that? You know, I, I have lived through the bailout of Greece, the bailout of Ireland, and prior to that, the discussion on uh, special support for states like uh, Hungary, uh, Latvia, and a couple of others elsewhere in the world, not in Europe. And I can tell you that both for Greece and for Ireland, including on, on Sunday when we discussed it, uh, in the presence of uh, very brave uh, Minister Brian Lenihan, there was a total sense of collective destiny. Now, of course, we have our, our specificities. We have our characteristics. Not every member state is the same, and not every parliament is the same. But the sense of collective destiny was definitely expressed at the table. And when it comes to the crunch, we actually did the job and we delivered what was expected. And in fact, it was what, back in January that you, last year that the economic crisis, you said, you mentioned, might lead to social unrest. Now, we've seen some angry scenes throughout the last week or two. Um, how bad is the social unrest going to get? Is it going to get worse or not? I certainly hope that it doesn't. And it, it rests with all public forces, uh, the, uh, the government, of course, the parliaments, the media, and all those that can express their views and stress the fact that it is not about uh, one category over the other, but it's, there is joint action needed, consensus required, beyond the political games that can actually separate people. And what about the future of the euro? I mean, people, people, there are a lot of quotes at the moment. People say that they think the euro will last for five years, but probably not anymore. Um, you would put, throw that confidence of yours further into the future, wouldn't you? I would say that those predictions are just rubbish. Uh, and I certainly, for myself, am convinced that if we've been able to overcome the threat of violence and war, the difficulties of people who have fought for so many years to actually become friends again, we can certainly also collectively decide and that we want to support our currency. I don't think there is any way out. It would certainly please some commentators and uh, analysts and, and people who 10 years ago thought that it was um, to fail. Well, it hasn't failed. And it's moving from crisis to crisis. And our collective determination is getting stronger as we move on. That's a, a very uh, pithy and thoughtful summary there of the situation. And uh, we're very lucky to have you with us there for many reasons. But one is the quote that you made some time ago when you said, women are better politicians better business leaders 
because they inject less libido and testosterone into the equation. <laughs> when did you first say that? Well, I've always been convinced that we are all better off uh, being together, men and women. And it's certainly not a statement that is aimed at excluding uh, the boys. I think we do well together. We need to bring our the, the best of what we each have and enrich ourselves with our diversity. It's a lovely quote by Paul Valéry, the poet. I think he was right. And so the summing up of our conversation today is vive la différence. <laughs> Merci beaucoup, Sir David Frost. And now Mozambique in southern Africa. It's a country where inflation is around 3%, pretty good. Growth is over 5%, pretty good. And exports are increasing, and yet it's still one of the poorest countries in the world. Is that the continuing effect of the civil war, which raised their, raged there less than 20 years ago? Or is it being starved of investment by developed nations? The country's foreign minister, Oldemira Baloy, He's in London at the moment. Why is he here? To try and drum up new investment for Mozambique. And he's with me now. Mr. Foreign Secretary, welcome. Very good, very good to have you, have you with us. Thanks. How's it going? It's, you've come here and around the world to raise money and mm -hmm. get further support for the improvements in life in Mozambique. How's it going? I think it's going very well. This was the first time I met the... Uh, the members of the new government. Uh, we had excellent uh, conversations. Uh, we share, in general, we share, we have shared views uh, on the performance of Mozambique, on the prospects, and therefore on the willingness of the government to continue supporting Mozambique. Uh, today we have an, there is uh, an ongoing investment uh, forum on, on Mozambique with an impressive attendance. Uh, in spite of the bad weather. Yes. Uh, so, so far, so good. Do you still need foreign aid, or have you mm -hmm. prospered enough to not need that anymore? Oh, we really do. We you do? We will need it for quite some time. But if the programs we are, if the, uh, we are undertaking uh, succeed, as we, we hope and are fighting for, uh, let's say that will reduce uh, significantly uh, for in aid. At this point in time, we need uh, for our budget, for instance, uh, we need something like 45% of support for, for, for the budget. This is, this is not good. We should be able to self-finance the budget and get uh, additional resources for investment, preferably through the private sector. And that is the aim uh, of the ongoing investment conference, as I said. And, and what do you feel today about the impact of Robert Mugabe on uh, Zimbabwe? I mean, the first 10 years or so, people thought he was doing a good job. But today, most people say he's a walking disaster area for the people of uh, Zimbabwe. Is that the way you feel? If we want to deal correctly with the situation in Zimbabwe, we have to look to the root causes and as some part of the world is uh, diabolizing uh, President Mugabe, it, I have no problem with that. I mean, that is their problem. But what I'm saying is that you have a party there that has a leader. The party wants to change because you, you change the leader. You had security problems during the elections in June. It was not him personally who was, who was moving around it's his own people. So let's face the facts. The mindset of the parties have to be changed so that they focus on the interests of people and move ahead. We are still in a good position to influence the process, to mediate, to try to persuade because we don't point fingers, we go to the facts. Look, there are some countries who, if they have taken a more cautious attitude, will be in a better position.
to influence the, the process. Now they are apart, and that is not good for the process, because the most serious the issue is, you have to deal with more people, more wheels you need to move forward. And now only one part of the world can come closer to him and say, well, this and this, this is not, and, and it's not right. And he listens. But there are those who just by seeing them, he become wild, so to speak. Well, thank you very much for that tour d'horizon we've had together. We're thank you. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. All thank the you. best. I thank you. A fortnight ago, as world leaders met in Lisbon for the NATO summit, the alliance promised to reset relations with its old enemy, Russia. Russia has offered to provide much needed military assistance and access to supply routes in Central Asia in exchange, presumably for a freeze on NATO expansion in Eastern Europe. So where does this leave the former Soviet states that were hoping to escape Russia's influence once and for all through NATO membership? Well, do they feel that the alliance has betrayed them for the sake of its failing war in Afghanistan? To find out, I'm delighted to be joined now by Georgia's Deputy Prime Minister, Georgi Baramitse. Welcome. Very good to have you with us, Georgi. It's a pleasure. Georgi. Um, tell me something. Uh, do you feel that these moves by NATO, apparently cozying up to Russia and so on, um, do you feel betrayed by those in Georgia? Not really. Uh, it looks like uh, that from the distance, but uh, uh, look at the facts. Uh, uh, in, in its declaration, NATO have strongly urged Russia to fulfill its obligations uh, to, uh, according to the ceasefire agreement uh, to withdraw uh, the, its occupying forces uh, from Georgia, also reverse its uh, illegal decision about uh, uh, the declaration of uh, uh, the, uh, the recog recognizing uh, independence of our occupied regions, as well as uh, in the very same document, uh, NATO reaffirmed its uh, Bucharest summit decision that Georgia will be member of NATO. It's uh, not to whether, but it's now already when Georgia become member of NATO. And uh, after the war with Russia, surprisingly, um, we've got uh, all necessary instruments that uh, uh, helps us to uh, get prepared for NATO membership. We have NATO-Georgia Commission, and we have annual national program. And so when... Uh President Saakashvili uh, addressed the European Parliament. He said there he proposed direct talks with the Kremlin. So that is that a thaw, a genuine thaw between the two countries? Absolutely, it always it really been, is. Uh, it, it's uh, well, we we always uh, uh, had the problems with Russia because Russia has a problem with the independent and European Georgia because they still, uh, you know, uh, are dreaming about the restoration of some kind of Soviet. Um, uh, union or uh, they, they, they are advocating for uh, spheres of ex exclusive influence. Putin have said that the solution of the Soviet wo Union was the biggest tragedy of the geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. So there is uh, still very big sentiments about this. Therefore, the, 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 the Moscow has a problem to digest uh, the idea of the independent and free and European Georgia. But it will, it will, it will come. Uh, we want peace with Russia. We want normal, constructive relationship because we share lots of objective interests. So therefore, we need to make Russia to understand that uh, in a small Georgia, which is democratic and uh, strong uh, European state, is not a indeed problem for Russia, but rather is an opportunity. So that's what we are seeking. We want uh, uh, constructive dialogue uh, in order to uh, normalize our relationship based on the Russia's uh, respect uh, toward Georgia's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And for this, of course, we need to have Russian occupying troops leave our 20% of the territory and also respect the right of the victims of the ethnic cleansing. 80% of the people being uh, forced out of uh, these occupying regions. And these 80%, not only ethnic Georgians, but other many other ethnic groups, should go back to their homes. I think this is absolutely legitimate request, and we are absolutely grateful for both European Union and NATO supporting uh, Georgia's causes uh, while approaching Russia, while trying to normalize relationship and make Russia be a good partner uh, for both organizations, not to not forgetting uh, the principles and not forgetting, not letting us down as a, as, a, as a small but European country, which is becoming already role model for democratic reforms, and this is very important for the entire West. Well, have you have you sent your opposite number in Russia 
uh, telegram of congratulations on getting the World Cup for uh, the next time around? Not really. I think really. that would be very good for these new warm relations. Not really. <laughs> Not really, because there are lots of doubts about that. So yeah. I, I won't comment uh, more, probably. <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of, uh, yeah. lots of uh, articles about this. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think NATO is actually m more concentrating more and more at the moment on Afghanistan rather than things in Eastern Europe and that sort of one, that uh, their attention on Eastern Europe has been deflected at the moment by the crisis in Afghanistan? Well, it, I think it's objective that uh, the priority is Afghanistan because if, if we, I say, not only NATO, but uh, we as a partner, we fail in Afghanistan, certainly uh, this problem will influence all of us in, 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 in the uh, Western society, let's say, mm -hmm. in the society that uh, exercises liberal democracy. So the, the, the fundamentalism is a threat for all of us. Uh, therefore, Georgia is uh, there uh, and behaving uh, as, a, as if we are already members of NATO. We are contributing to the net security. Um, not many people know that Georgia is the number one contributor for ISAF per capita. Really? Absolutely. And uh, second overall uh, non-NATO contributor, we have 925 troops and most of them in the south uh, without caveats uh, fighting uh, shoulder over shoulder with the uh, U.S. Uh, 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 the Marines. And we are committed to do more. Has the progress in Georgia been as much as you hoped at the time of the Rose Revolution? Or, and in fact, has it exceeded your hopes? It's uh, 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 noteworthy and uh, 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 very important to underline our achievements. For, for instance, the World Bank declared Georgia as the world's number one reformer according to the five years uh, uh, you know, period reform uh, time. Uh, so second, same World Bank put us in number 12 in terms of doing business, easy to do business. EBRD declared Georgia uh, Europe's third least corrupt country. And third least corrupt. Right. Absolutely. Right. And uh, certainly uh, uh, the, the best uh, in terms of doing business in Central and Eastern Europe. So these are, these are already great achievements. And the most important for us, it's not the, uh, the ratings of the international uh, organizations, but uh, the opinion of our own people, according to the Gallup uh, survey, 98% of uh, our citizens have said that they never paid during the last 12 months any bribe. And this is already the third year, consecutive years, that we have these results. 98%, no, yes. bri no bribes. What's the, po what's the population of... 4.5. Uh, and six years so ago... 2%, so 2% of that would be what? Uh, the 2% of people, well, it just means quite uh, a, a few hundred thousand people have had and bribes. And uh, just six years ago, uh, it would have been absolutely the opposite. Thank you very much Thank for being you. with us. I appreciate Kids it. the next time. Absolutely. In a moment, are newspapers doomed or not? I'll be asking a media magnet who owns quite a few. He hails from Russia. He's here now after the news headlines.